test for this, uh, and, uh, which, which we now recognize. I mean, that's not to say that other people before 1971 were making the mistakes, but that's, I think it was Van Preble's paper that spurred her to be thinking in this direction. Now, this is important because at this stage, Lorna thought that the behavior problems of autistic children could be explained as secondary to the underlying impairments, which we will now agree. And she actually said poverty of social contact resulted from impairment in the development of all forms of language. So at that point, language was the key to her thinking was part of the, what was the problem. Then that led her on to, in 1977, to begin to look at imagination and the relationship of symbolic play and development of language that became her area of interest. And again, to quote, she said, one of the clinical features of early childhood autism was poverty or absence of symbolic play. She hypothesized that the central problem was a severe impairment of the ability to abstract concepts from experience, to give these abstractions symbolic labels and draw from them for relevant associations when thinking of the past, reacting to the present, and planning for the future. Now, this is key to where we are now, which I've come to, uh, in our understanding of how important <coughs> lack of social imagination is in the uh, understanding of the autism spectrum. So, there it was in 1977. So, in the study she carried out, uh, she felt that the lack of symbolic play was the outward sign of this central problem. And in the study, she had three groups, and these were children with no symbolic play, children with stereotype repetitive copying play, which began her thinking beyond the absence of symbolic play, and those children with flexible, varied symbolic play. So she's actually beginning to see that you can, it's not a question of have you got something or have you not got something, that there is a, a different manifestations along these dimensions. Now, in 1978, she designed the first edition of the Children's Handicaps Word Behavior and Skills HBS, which is a structured interview schedule, forget, sorry, the mistake of the deal there, which was used in the Campbell study. So this was the very first semi-structured interview to try and tease out the patterns of behavior in children in the spectrum. And the HBS was the precursor of the diagnostic interview for social and communication <coughs> disorders, DISCO, which I will talk about when I talk about the work at the Norman Institute. Now, uh, uh, forgive me for, uh, I have to bring up this study because of course this was the beginning of our thinking of the autism spectrum. And this is where I joined Lorna at this point. We published in 79, but I was there sometime before that. This study took a very long time. So, based on Lotter's uh, epidemiological study in Middlesex, prevalence study, um, Lorna looked at his uh, results. Uh, and he, Lotter, had used Canner's criteria very strictly to a total population of children of all levels of ability. Uh, and that came the, the magic figure, four to five per 10,000, which stuck with us for so many years, which, you know, autism was a rare condition. So what we did then is, uh, we got in a London borough called Camberwell, we looked for any kind of different <coughs> behavior in a total population of children, identified as having a special need, because we couldn't do a population study of all the children in the world, because that would have be been just enormous. But because Lotta had identified most of his children as having special needs, we only looked at children with special needs. And what we found was a group fitting Canner's criteria, with the same prevalence uh, um, as found by Lotta, similar to us, and then a very few children fitting Asperger's criteria were also identified. But this group was very small because the mainstream children in the area were not screened. And we were at that early stages of understanding Asperger's syndrome. 
Uh, and there were, uh, there were in fact one or two children, I remember, uh, who were in our study, who were in special needs. And one little boy uh, actually was in a, in a school for, for delicate children. So in those days, you had amazing types of special education. So that's, he was one who had our spoken syndrome, and we know it now. But what we found was there were many more children who didn't fit CAMES or Asperger's criteria that had mixtures of the different syndromes. And what we came up with was that the, <coughs> the, the difficulties in social interaction, communication, and imagination could occur with a very wide range of manifestations. But however they were shown, they, they tended to cluster together and were highly associated with repetitive patterns of behaviors. It was difficult to draw neat boundaries between the named syndromes and those with the, what we call the triad of impairments who didn't fit into a syndrome. So the concept of a spectrum of autistic disorders fitted better than a categorical approach of putting people into subgroups. Didn't apply a smooth continuum from most to least severe. You could have all kinds of combinations of features were possible because our stress is looking at the whole person along different dimensions rather than looking at a subgroup. That wasn't our thinking. What was our evidence for a spectrum? Many people show mixtures of features of the different subgroups. One person can show different features in different environments. You know, the child in a nice structured clinic setting will behave very differently from that same child in an unstructured playground, playground setting. <coughs> uh, one person can show different features at different ages. So if you have a three-year-old presenting for diagnosis, that child could appear to be like Hannah's description. Same child at 13 has Asperger's character. And it sounded maybe what John Berger was implying was that you know, maybe his son moved along the spectrum in terms of his ability and his acquirement of language. Members of the same family can show different features. I mean, in our diagnostic practice now, we often have families with more than one child along the spectrum. <coughs> Identical twins and triplets showing different features, which is quite interesting with one set of girl triplets. And if we are looking at subgroups, one of them fitted Canna's classic autism and the other two fitted Asperger's pattern of behavior, which is interesting. So the, the point of what we were getting at here was, was that in clinical practice, it was very difficult to define boundaries between the different diagnostic categories, whatever the criteria was being and that the clinical pictures found with autism spectrum disorders fitted better with a concept of multiple dimensions than the concept of separate definable categories. As was said earlier, there's no one person exactly the same. Each person is an individual and has their own particular pattern. So uh, it's much easier and better to describe our multiple dimensions. And more importantly, Individual needs are more accurately assessed from the profile of levels of different dimensions than assigning a categorical diagnosis. So Johnny with Asperger's syndrome and Harry with Asperger's syndrome, yes, it tells you something, but it doesn't tell you about Johnny and Harry. You have to describe them along these different, different dimensions. Going back now, as I said earlier, I was only talking about how she first thought it was the language impairment was then following, you know, leading on to social difficulties and behavior difficulties. But we now feel that the social impairment, due to the absence or maybe impairment of the social instinct, is the most fundamental problem of all. And going back to Leo Kanna, uh, as I said earlier, he did say he thought it was present from birth and was genetic. I wish he'd kept to that. Uh, and to quote him, he said, we must assume the children have come into the world with innate inability to form the usual biologically provided affective contact with people. That's what he said. Okay, now in 1964, <coughs> uh, early days, uh, but back to that mother's instinct, uh, Lorna said then that social withdrawal is an important characteristic of autistic children, which perhaps is related to the inability to communicate in speech. She's still talking about language. 
A mother often senses this in her child almost from birth. Later, the mother notices that the child does not attract her attention to things going on around. Indeed, her child appears oblivious of them. And I can, I can explain to you, she has told, she told me she was on a train with Susie sitting on her lap, and there's another parent with a small child nearby, and they were going along, and the other child actually pointed to the sheep in the field. And her, Susie was completely oblivious, and she thought she had that feeling there's something not right here. And that's anecdotal. And now, of course, that has been picked up and is now referred to as lack of joint referencing, which is key in the diagnosis of young children. So she said it in 1964. So going back to the social impairment being what we feel is the key to diagnosis. So in children and adults with severe or profound learning disabilities, the level of development may be too low for communication. Do you look at communication? and imagination. So in, in sense of the criteria for the diagnostic systems, you can't use that. But, as far as we were concerned, interest in other human beings is present virtually from the beginning of life. So this is the key. And, and then at the other end of the spectrum, children and adults with extremely high levels of cognitive ability, may be very verbally articulate, with good imagination, that we find they have learned the social skills through their intellect rather than by social intuition. So the social difficulty is the key. Now, coming down to the present, uh, we revised our thinking about the triad. Uh, so since the 70s, now we feel that all people on the spectrum have similar difficulties, which are those of difficulties in social interaction social communication and social imagination, which are associated with the repetitive rigid style of functioning. So what we mean by social imagination is not to do with creativity, it's not to do with ability to imagine, but it's actually using that skill in a social sense of being able to think about what other people are thinking, think about the bigger picture, understanding consequences of your actions, learning from experiences, uh, this is still a fundamental difficulty uh, in, with people on the autism spectrum. Classification back to, you know, we're talking about dimensions, talking about categories, and unfortunately we're still wedded to uh, both the American system and the UK system of DSM and ICD, uh, and you know, we, we've always said there are problems in classification. We recognize that, you know, we as researchers, need to have, uh, identify what sort of people we're looking at and, and what questions we're asking. But in fact, we think that apart from the lack of social instinct, untypical behaviours are found to varying degrees in all the diagnostic subgroups, in all of the developmental disorders, and to some extent in typical development. So the so-called syndromes in which autism spectrum disorders have been divided are not unique and separate syndromes, which I've already said. This is understood in the context of the full range of developmental disorders right up to the borderlines of typical development normality. The categories have not been helpful in prescribing type of education, behavior management, and treatment. As a result, we have the new DSM-5. And I would like to think that Lorna's work actually may have influenced the rethinking of what of the, the new DSM-5, where we now have no subgroups. Autism spectrum disorder is defined as a neurodevelopmental disorder, which must be present from infancy or early childhood, but may not be detected until later because of minimal social demands and support from parents and carers and earliest. How important that is. So we're not wedded now have you got a problem before three or after three? If you've got before three, it's autism, and it's after three, it's Asperger's syndrome. So fortunately, that's gone. So why, why, why was the change? It's almost, you know, what I've already said long and already been saying for many, many years, no one has. But the distinctions between the subgroups were inconsistent. It was inconsistent over time, as I've mentioned, variable interpretation of those different sites, 
dependent on associated features such as severity, language level, and intelligence, which now are considered separate <coughs> from the diagnosis, and that people show mixtures of features of different subgroups. Very difficult, recognize now, it's difficult to draw neat dividing lines between the subgroups. And the concept of the spectrum is better in specific subgroups. And the reason that social and communication are now combined is that research evidence shows that it's difficult to separate social and communication symptoms as they overlap. So now they're combined into one criteria. For example, eye contact, gesture, facial expressions are both social and community. Now, removal of the subgroups, Asperger syndrome, big question. Uh, as mentioned in early 1971, Lorna had read, read Van Preven's paper, and then in 1981, she then published the paper, uh, paper linking the pattern of behavior described by Asperger as part of the autism spectrum. Uh, and the reason that she did that was because she recognized that this description could overlap, and, and it, it was important because the core difficulties were similar for all people on the autism spectrum. So in the early 90s, the SM4 and ICD-10 included Asperger's description in their classification systems as a separate subgroup. And now, this is the important point, is that we feel that recognition of the pattern of behavior is useful clinically and should remain as a description which can be specified by a diagnostician. So we are saying not to remove the term Asperger's syndrome because it has value. It has value for understanding the, where the person is on the spectrum. All the books that are written for people with Asperger's syndrome are so helpful. If you, once something exists, nothing exists until it has a name, you can't just take away. So this is what we do at the Lorna Wing Center. In our diagnostic formulation, we say A has an autism spectrum disorder and this fits the pattern of behavior described by Asperger known as Asperger syndrome. And we then describe the individual's pattern of skills and difficulty, which is most important. So we will continue to use the term Asperger syndrome. We're not going to be away to DSM-5. So that's the history of where we were where all it came from and where we are now. But now let's think about some of her, her other special interests. Women and girls. This is my passion, of course, at the moment. And it was the fact that it was Lorna's idea that we need research autism, and really we needed to have a conference specifically on women and girls. And that happened in 2009, which was facilitated by research autism and was chaired by Lorna and Richard Mills. And at the same time that conference happened at the Lorraine Centre, we were having an increasing number of girls and women referred for diagnosis. And most of them were being referred through mental health services. And we recognised historically there's a strong gender bias of all males and females. And that now we recognise that autism presents differently in females. The core difficulties are the same. They're not gender specific, but the way the behaviors are manifested are different in the females. And that females mask their symptoms far better than males. And as a result, professionals are still less likely to diagnose girls and women, <coughs> even when the symptoms and behaviors are evident. And then the other area that led on from our interest in women and girls was a project, an EU project, which was, was chaired by Richard Mills again uh, with other, other countries. Um, and it was called Autism in Pink. And that, that caused much uh, discussion, you can imagine, by the people themselves feeling very angry at that the, the name was given by someone else. And not us, I might say. Uh, but that project was so valuable in helping us through research, learning about women with autism from different cultures in different countries. So that, that bit of work was really very important. And going back again to the diagnostic criteria, the current system still 
the OCD uh, DSM-5 still does not give us examples of types of difficulty shown in the girls and women, and they're not good at recognizing the symptoms in girls and women. Um, the methods used to diagnosis are still skewed to the male presentation of the condition, and we do need a much wider perspective regarding social communication and imaginative dimensions, in addition to the special interests and rigidity of behavior. So, plug for the DISCO, uh, we use the DISCO and this enables clinicians to ask the right questions and make appropriate observations. So we, we look at the questions and we look at perhaps the female presentations of the uh, spectrum. Now, other, other interests, the catatonia. Uh, in, in 2000, uh, we, we seem to have a number of referrals, clinical referrals to the Centre Center uh, of individuals. They were usually young adolescents or young adolescents or young adults, and they were men actually, uh, who were referred with, with quick catatonia. Uh, and so Lorna and her colleague Anita Shah recognized the overlap of some catatonic behaviors in adolescents and young adults with autism. And they concluded that catatonia can be a complication of autism spectrum disorders. And if someone has catatonic-like behaviors, this has major implications for management and support. And there's some very good articles, research articles written around uh, this subject. But she felt quite passionately about this because she re reflected back on her days in when she first started in a, the old mental health hospitals, psychiatric hospitals, where she said there were many people who were diagnosed with uh, catatonic schizophrenia who she now felt probably had autism. So um, the work continues. Uh, Amita Shah is continuing the work on catatonia, which is really very important. Then treatments. I mean, this is really key to one of the eyes in research autism. Uh, read back in 1986, uh, a time when, as a parent and a professional, Lorna was frequently asked about treatments for autism. And so in 1986, she set up guidelines as to why proper evaluations were essential. To quote, she said, parents of young children with autism are vulnerable to false theories of causes and to claims of quick fix solutions. Scientific evaluation of treatments is essential, but can be difficult, time-consuming, and expensive. So in 1986, she wrote this paper. Now, since then, Lorna's guidelines have been followed up notably, of course, by Research Autism, who have published the book, Choosing Autism, Autism Interventions, a research-based guide, and of course, the website uh, dedicated to high-quality research into autism treatments, therapies, and other approaches. And to my mind, uh, as a clinician and working with families and parents, uh, you know, this, this information base is essential. A new parent of a newly diagnosed child help, you know, let's find out what is, has got good evidence-based outcomes and good research. There's an awful lot of stuff out there that's very confusing. So you know, this is so important that this information is available for parents and families. One of our longest special interests was animals. And again, back to Susie. Uh, Susie had an extreme phobia, panic, panic attacks if she saw a dog. So Lorna felt, right, I've got to deal with this. So they bought a beautiful golden retriever from Harris <coughs> called Candy. And Candy became Susie's friend. And Susie was able to go out with Candy, and she was able to hold the lead and walk out with her. And it really was, a, for, for Laura and John, you know, a real miracle having Candy. So, of course, she followed that up uh, with Richard, uh, and they linked with uh, Dogs for the Disabled and set up the PAUSE project through research autism. And consequently, various papers have been published on pet pet dogs and autism. Now, unfortunately, you know, scientifically, uh, research-based, very difficult to evaluate this type of project. 
But you know, we, we must also take on projects that have qualitative use for parents and for children, rather than having to be precisely uh, scientifically rigid in our, um, in our in collective information. So the results, Richard has given me this, and Richard, uh, the results have showed that there was a positive, significant impact on reducing parental stress and on problematic behaviors of the children, and the children again reducing stress in the children. Parents report in, in, in indicating calmer child and bonding of the child and the dog, and also positive experiences from the children's own reports. So this has been a real positive thing, and I knew Lorna was passionate about this. The other, another passion of hers, uh, which again related to Susie, was research on excessive drinking of fluids in children and adults on the autism spectrum. And she pursued this with Richard, and this has now been, will be published in Advances in Autism this November, because she felt this was something, it's very, because it's quite, quite life-threatening, uh, it's this excessive drinking of fluids. Uh, moving on quickly to the work at the Royal Marine Centre. Uh, the NAS Centre, we were called the Centre for Social and Communication Disorders because at the time, in 1991, we did not, we wanted to see any child with a social communication problem, not just autism. We're not set up as a, a service for autism. And it was, I think, the very first centre to provide a complete diagnostic and assessment service for children, adolescents, and adults. So we weren't confined <coughs> to NHS, children's services, and adult services. We could see anyone, any ability level, at any age. And it's just an ordinary house in the street in Bromley. And then, in 2008, the centre was renamed the NAS Wing Centre, in recognition of her work. She was very disgusted with this. She was very upset about this because she said, you don't do that until someone's dead. <laughs> but she got used to the idea of having it called after her. And she didn't like any accolades, as you know. So the diagnostic uh, formulation of the, at the London Center is we use a multidimensional diagnostic formulation using the DISCO. Uh, and it, in fact, it was Christopher Gilberg, who actually gave us that acronym, the DISCO. It causes all sorts of amusement when people ring up to say, I'm inquiring about DISCO training, and I'm doing the art in Tango. So, you know, it's causing much amusement. So, through from 1991 through to 2015, uh, we have been working research based and clinically based with Professor Sue Leakland at Cardiff University in looking at developing a measurement of the spectrum using the, the DISCO. And the, the research based on this, in terms of reliability and validity of the DISCO, uh, papers have been written, algorithms have been uh, valid, and then comparisons have been made with the ADIR and the ADOS, with strong agreement with the different diagnostic interviews, different tools, and also the different subgroups uh, there were no clear subgroups. We looked at a whole a lot of patterns of behavior and we did a multivariate analysis. In fact, it was very difficult to put people into subgroups. It, it confirmed that there was a wide manifestation of problems. <coughs> so we actually offer training courses for professionals involved in diagnosis of autism and disease to understand the autism spectrum using the DISCO framework. So the training is not just helping you to use the interview and how to interpret the questions, it is actually using the a concept of the spectrum and a dimensional approach. So if anyone's interested, this is my plug, you can contact the Law Centre for more details. Then, following from this, from the research side of things, uh, we've been carrying out research with, with our methods for many, many years. And uh, more recently, uh, Sue Leetham was before at the University of Kent, uh, Canterbury, and then she moved as professor uh, to Cardiff University. And we have international partnerships. I'm looking at my friend here from Canada. We have links with international, we have Japan and, and Netherlands and uh, Scandinavian countries. And there are many publications using the DISCO. 
Uh, there's a large disco data set of individuals at different ages, and there are new questionnaires uh, using the disco, giving us insight into repetitive behaviours, sensory features, and more recently, or currently, pathological demand avoidance. So there are new plans for the research network to broaden the network to other researchers internationally and here. So if anyone is interested, then please contact us. Because we need to do further validation of the DISCO regarding age-appropriate versions, children and adults, and of course gender items. Uh, we're looking at DSM-5, we have a DSM-5 algorithm, and you know, we wait to see what ICD-11 will bring. We're making comparisons of the full and an abbreviated version of the DISCO and relating that, linking that perhaps with ADOS and 3DI. We're looking at signposting items, so it say maybe items in the DISCO that would be signposting perhaps for GPs and at the level where just recognizing red flags uh, using DISCO items. So that's being validated at the moment. New training for researchers and new research using the dimensional approach. For example, we're looking at <coughs> social impairment subtypes, looking at imagination, difficult behaviors, research on adults. So lots of things happening now are on the DISCO and the research work based at the Royal Marine Center in the network. And you can link in with that site if you want any more information about publications. Finally, personal. Okay, now, Lorna's love of gardening was a well-deserved hobby in her very busy life. She loved her, her flowers, she loved her vegetables. She used to bring, in the summer, we were, I can't think of the inner dizzy, is that the right word, with tomatoes, cucumbers, courgettes, and she'd bring them in and everyone had them. So, uh, somebody said, and I'm not sure who, that she nurtured her colleagues like she nurtured her seedlings and her plants. And here's a photo of some of her colleagues, uh, including myself, of course. But she did, she was wonderful. She gave to everyone, and uh, her ideas were just so inspirational. Then, the other thing was that she loved detective stories, particularly Sherlock Holmes. And I think it was Richard who actually said that she was rather like a Miss Marple in that she, she herself was a detective. Uh, she always was curious about everything, fascinated by the complex way people behaved. She had an eye for detail, passion for knowing the truth and fairness to all. Once she had an idea, she would pursue it to the bitter end, much sometimes for my cost, when she would bring me at any time, day or night, I've just thought of something. And she would query and never give up on a clue. And all of that was to improve the quality of lives of autistic people and their families better. So she received many awards throughout her life. I won't go into uh, how many she has. And I think, again, quoting someone who said she was one of the supreme authorities in the world today of autism. She showed us how to combine academic rigor and fidelity to the scientific method with a deep humanity. She never sought accolades, was modest, and always <coughs> ahead of her time in <coughs> On a personal note, she was my mentor, my inspiration of all my work. She instilled in me the fascination of autism in our lifetime of working together, and this photo at the end, towards the end of her life, where she was in a residential home, and she's with Tokyo Uchiyama and uh, myself and Carol. Uh, and this is a lovely picture of what she was like right at the end. Never looked old, she always looked so young. And finally, to conclude, I want to go back to the beginning where I mentioned we have learned most about autism from individuals themselves. And I want to give a quote from a woman with Asperger's syndrome called Ollie Edwards. Recently, she's written a paper. And this, it highlights our logo, our disco logo, is the prism with a rainbow coming from the prism. And what she has said is that the autism spectrum is vast and beautifully complex. Some individuals are easily identified. But for others, their autism is a prism. It's present 
but yet it remains transparent until the appropriately trained clinician shines their knowledge and light onto it. It is only then that the colors and complexities can be seen and understood. And very, very finally, Lorna's very favorite uh, overhead, nature never draws a line without studying it. Thank you very much.